The distribution of the primes is one of the most important problems in number theory. And I've got a conjecture related to the distribution of primes to show everyone today. So it is Legendre's conjecture. And it says for every natural number n, there is a prime p between n squared and n plus 1 squared. Now, there are a bunch of related results, and I've got some of those listed here. So the first is Bertrand's postulate. So I've actually made a video about this. That says there is a prime between n and 2 times n. The next, there's this nice result by Ingham which says there is a prime between n cubed and n plus 1 cubed. That has a real similar flavor to this, obviously. And then there is a, another result by Baker, Harmon, and Pence that says there is a prime between n minus n to the 21 over 40 and n. And this is true if n is large enough. So I would wager that this isn't true for fairly small n. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a little bit of a chart showing this in action. So let's start fairly small. Let's look at 2 squared and 2 plus 1 squared, which is 3 squared. So that would be 4 and 9. We can very clearly find a prime between 4 and 9. In fact, there are two, 5 and 7. So we've got some primes between 2 squared and 2 plus 1 squared. Now let's look between 25, which is 5 squared, and 36, which is 5 plus 1, or 6 squared. Again, there are a couple of primes between these two numbers. One of them is 29. Now let's look between 10 squared, which is 100, and 11 squared, which is 121. Again, you can find a few primes in this range as well. 103 would be an example of one of them. Now let's go even bigger. Let's look at 234 squared and 235 squared. So I ran a little bit of a Mathematica code and I found a prime between these two numbers. It is 54,799. But there are several primes in this range. So I think that's good enough. We've proven this conjecture. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since of course that's not true. This conjecture is still a conjecture. It's not proven. But what I will say is that it has been checked up to a fairly large number, and that is up to the number two times 10 to the nine. So if we look at n equals two times 10 to the nine, and n plus one equals two times 10 to the nine plus one, and we look between those two squares, it has been checked that there are primes between those two squares and every other set of consecutive squares, which is smaller. Okay, so where can we really go from here? Well, I'd like to give a heuristic argument why we expect this conjecture to be true. And of course, whenever you have big conjectures in math, there's usually some sort of heuristic argument for why we expect this conjecture to be true. That's what makes it what I'll call a good conjecture. Okay, let's get into that. So our main tool for this heuristic argument will be the prime number theorem. And this is typically the main tool for all of these arguments towards the truth of certain conjectures regarding the distribution of primes. I think we've used this before. So the prime number theorem says that if we set the function pi of x equal to the number of primes that are less than or equal to x, then the limit as x goes to infinity of pi of x over x over the natural log of x is one. So that means we have the following asymptotic relationship here. For very large values of x, pi of x should be, like I said, asymptotic to x over the natural log of x, which really means we've got this approximate equality for large values of x. Okay, so that brings us to the following two statements. And again, these statements follow like from this asymptotic relationship, but they're really like more expectations instead of facts. Okay, so the number of primes 
p that are between one and n squared should be approximately equal to n squared over the natural log of n squared. Let's notice that that's equal to n squared over two times the natural log of n using logarithm rules. And of course, this is where it turns from a precise argument to like an imprecise argument because this asymptotic relationship is not really an approximation and we're using it as an approximation. But like I said, this is not a proof of this conjecture. This is an argument of why we expect this conjecture to be true. Okay, so now let's do the same thing for n plus one squared. So the number of primes p between one and n plus one squared uh, should be approximately equal to n plus one squared over the natural log of n plus one squared, which is equal to n plus one squared over two times the natural log of n plus one using logarithm rules. Okay, so now we can put both of these together to get the approximate number of primes or the expected number of primes between n squared and n plus one squared. So let's do that. So expected number of primes between n squared and n plus one squared should be the difference in these two numbers. I'll factor a one half out and then we'll have n plus one squared over the natural log of n plus one minus n squared over the natural log of n. Okay, good. So now what we'd like to do is investigate the limit of this thing right here. We won't really need the half here, but what we'll show, so I'll put to show here, that this limit is infinity. So that means the expected number of primes between n squared and n plus one squared grows without bound as n gets larger and larger and larger. But since it grows without bound as n gets larger and larger and larger, then that means we expect there to be at least one prime in this range. Okay, so that being said, that's our heuristic argument, which I can't stress enough is not a proof but it does provide some maybe evidence that this should be true, along with that list that we made earlier and checking it up to a very large number. Okay, so anyway, we'll finish this video by showing this limit which I've written in blue. I've changed my variable from n to x just so that we have a continuous looking variable because we're gonna use L'Hopital's rule down the line. So we want to investigate the limit as x goes to infinity of x plus one squared over the natural log of x plus one minus x squared over the natural log of x. So you can check that this is of type infinity over infinity. That being said, we're gonna combine these two fractions together and then use some inequalities to simplify this before we do our final application of L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's combine these fractions using common denominators. Our common denominator will be the product of these logs. So we have the limit as x goes to infinity, and this has equality right now. So we'll have x plus one squared times the natural log of x minus x squared times the natural log of x plus one all over the natural log of x times the natural log of x plus one. Okay, so that's looking good. And now from here, we're gonna use a pretty interesting inequality involving the natural log. And that goes like this. So the natural log of x is less than the square root of x, which that implies that one over the natural log of x is larger than one over the square root of x. And very similarly, we have the natural log of x plus one is less than the square root of x, which implies that one over the natural log of x plus one is less than one over the square root of x. Sorry, that should be is greater than one over the square root of x. Okay, cool. 
Now what we'll do is replace those natural logs in the denominator with the square roots of x and then put the appropriate inequality. But notice we've got two of those natural logs, which means really we have the square root of x squared or x. So that leaves us something like this. We have the limit as n goes to infinity of, we'll have x plus one squared times the natural log of x. I'm actually gonna go ahead and multiply that out. So we'll have x squared plus two x plus one times the natural log of x minus x squared times the natural log of x plus one. And then this is all over x. And that's not an equality, that should be an inequality. Okay, so now I'm gonna break this into pieces. So I'll take this x squared natural log of x, this x squared natural log of x plus one, and combine them using log rules, and then cancel one of the x's with what's in the denominator. Then I'll do a couple more uh, simplifications as well. So we'll have the limit as x goes to infinity of x times the natural log of x over x plus one. So like I said, the x squared cancels down just to an x. And then using log rules, I can put those two things together. And then we'll also have plus two times the natural log of x, and then finally plus the natural log of x over x. So we're left with something like this. Now let's see what happens as we let x go to infinity. In fact, all three of these limits exist, so we might wanna calculate them separately. I guess I'll go ahead and point out that one of them doesn't really need to be calculated. The natural log of x approaches infinity as x approaches infinity. So that approaches infinity. Now let's maybe calculate this one right here, then I'll leave that one as a simple homework exercise. So we've got our limit as x goes to infinity of x times the natural log of x over x plus one. So notice this is an indeterminate form of type infinity times zero, because as x approaches infinity, the natural log of x over x plus one approaches the natural log of one, which is zero. So I can put this into a correct form for L'Hopital's rule by replacing that x in the numerator with a one over x in the denominator. Now we can apply L'Hopital's rule. So let's take the derivative of the numerator. That'll leave us with x plus one over x times the derivative of the inside here. But then using the quotient rule, the derivative of that inside will be something like this. We'll have x plus one minus x over x squared. And this is all over the derivative of the denominator, which is negative one over x squared. And I made one of like my pet peeve mistakes that students often make, and that is I forgot to carry my limit on. So I have the limit as x goes to infinity. Okay, so now let's see what happens here. Notice this x and this x cancel, leaves us with one over x squared. We have negative one over x squared. So that means this and this cancel down to the number negative one, which I'll put out front, but then that rational expression simplifies to one or limits towards one. So that means the limit of all of this stuff right here is negative one. Okay. And then likewise, you can use similar methods to discover that the limit of this is zero. So like I said, all of those limits exist. Only one is infinite. So that tells us that the limit of this whole thing is infinite. So in other words, the expected value of the number of primes between n squared and n plus one squared is not zero. It gets larger and larger and larger and larger as n gets larger and larger and larger. So like I said, this is definitely not a proof of Legendre's conjecture, but it is a heuristic argument for why we expect it to be true. And that's a good place to stop. 
Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.